Hey guys, Jim here from the Intrepid Museum, Intrepid Sea, Air, and Space Museum, uh, located in the heart of Hell's Kitchen in the middle of Midtown Manhattan, New York City. And today we're going to do another virtual live, virtual Intrepid Adventures program. Uh, we're going to get into Journey to Space. But before we do that, if you'd like to keep these free programs flowing, please uh, think about supporting us and clicking the link that Alicia has put in the chat right there, and it'll go a long way. Right, they enable us to keep these things going through the fall and for the rest of the year. Okay, um, a little bit about the Intrepid Museum. Uh, let me get a bigger picture there so you can see it. There you go, guys. What kind of a ship do you think the Intrepid Museum was slash is? Uh, let's see. Uh, I know the picture is kind of taken from the water level here, looking up. But you can probably kind of tell that it's a big uh, ship. If you guess it's a warship, that would be absolutely correct. But what kind of warship? Looks like it might have a big flat old top on there uh, that carried something. If you are thinking that the Intrepid was and is an aircraft carrier, you are absolutely correct. Intrepid was an aircraft carrier, in other words, carrying airplanes way before it became a museum. Now, the Intrepid was commissioned in uh, 1943, August 16th, 1943. That's correct. Coming up on Monday, the Intrepid Museum will turn 78 years old. And if you tune in the next day on Tuesday at 3 o'clock to Intrepid Virtual Adventures, we're going to do a very special program celebrating the Intrepid's birthday. We're going to talk about the history of the name Intrepid throughout history. All right. That's going to be uh, quite a good program. Now, the Intrepid served in World War II. Uh, this picture is from World War II, and you can see all the aircraft on top of the deck there. It served in the Cold War and also served in the Vietnam War. Um, so an aircraft carrier, what does it do? Well, an aircraft carrier, quite simply, carries aircraft, okay? And as you can see here, proof of that. Why carry aircraft? Well, do the aircraft on the, the top of the deck here uh, from this World War II picture, do they look big enough to maybe flew ac to across oceans uh, to get involved with the wars that we were fighting over in Europe or over in the South Pacific? Absolutely not. They're way too small and way too specialized to do that. So um, what they're going to do is to simply provide a, a place for them to take off and to land. And that's the whole purpose behind an aircraft carrier. All right. Um, the Intrepid will be decommissioned in 1974. And open up as the museum that you see today uh, in 1982. And by the way, tell us in the chat. Feel free to say hi, where are you tuning in from, and if you've been to the Intrepid before, or if you plan on going there sometime in the near future, which I hope you do. Now, going back to this first photo here, Intrepid looks pretty big, and we talked about that. If you asked Intrepid to do a headstand on its bow, it would be uh, 913 feet into the air. In World War II, it was 845 feet or so. Today, it would be 913 feet. That's almost as tall as another famous landmark here in New York City, the Chrysler Building, which is 1,042 feet long. If you were to lay that Chrysler Building on the deck there, only the tower at the very top would, would hang off the end. But as Intrepid sits in the water today, as it is in that picture, it's still eight stories tall. So that's, uh, th that's pretty big. Okay, um, aircraft carrier is, of course, a floating airport, and that's what, of course, it looks here. That's what it's doing in this picture right here. Um, how many aircraft were on board? Uh, if you want to guess at how many aircraft were on board, give us a, a, an idea in the chat. Um, there's a lot there. You can see some people on the deck, too. Very small. Let me put my laser pointer on here so I can help you guys out. You see some some people right there on the deck and all these aircraft. Do you think it was 50 aircraft? Do you think it was 75 aircraft? Hmm, okay, we got a we got a couple of guesses coming in. Tom, hey Tom, 80 aircraft. That's a pretty good guess. So, in World War II, between 80 and 100 aircraft on board Intrepid. In Vietnam, well, the aircraft were a little bit bigger, a little bit faster more importantly, heavier. So uh, we're gonna cut it down to about 60 to 65 aircraft. 
frankly, yeah, there, there you go. Frankly, Al, nice to have you back, buddy. Uh, and uh, your guess is pretty good for the Vietnam era. World War II was more in that 90, uh, that 90 um, region right there. Okay, so we probably can figure out very, very easily why the Intrepid was a sea museum. Well, it's a ship. Uh, why was it an air museum? Well, uh, because it has a lot of aircraft. And today we still have 28 aircraft visible uh, for you to come visit when you, when you visit the museum. But why was it a space museum? Well, I did mention that the Intrepid served during the Cold War. And as I always like to put it, the Cold War had several symptoms, okay? Uh, one of the symptoms of the Cold War was the Korean War. Another symptom was actually the Vietnam War, right? But a big symptom, and the way we're going to talk about uh, Intrepid's involvement in the Cold War today, is the space race. Okay, the Cold War and the space race. Here's my next question, guys. What were the countries involved in the space race? If you think you know what the countries were that were involved in the space race, simply put it down there in the chat. You could probably guess one country was the United States. Okay, that's the easy one. The second country, put it down there in the chat. We kind of associate the color red with it. Um, here's a hint, it's not in existence anymore, or at least in the way it was before. There you go, Vash, nice to have you back as well. The USA and the Soviet Union, today they are Russia, okay? Very, very good. Now, what was the Cold War? The Cold War was a, a, a war of ideologies. Uh, which country had a better idea of how to live, on how to how to be, how to govern their their countries? Okay, very good. All these all these uh, excellent answers coming in, and of course the, the major symptom of the Cold War was the space race. Now, if you're like me and you cycle, um, maybe you run, maybe you walk very quickly, maybe you're competitive with other people who do the same activities. You run races, right? Or you you enter races. Uh, what's the goal in a race? Well, the goal is to finish, to get across the finish line, to get across the finish line first, okay? Or as close as you can to it. So what do you think was the finish line in the space race, guys? Again, put it down there in the chat. What do you think the finish line in our space race was between the United States and the Soviet Union? Okay, some answers trying, uh, some answers starting to come in, some good answers, excellent. Keep those answers coming. What was the finish line? Was it just to go up in space? Was it to hang out and do a few experiments in space? Nope, okay, yes, Vash, very good. Frankly, L, excellent guys, the moon. The finish line for the space race would be the moon. So the first country to make it to the moon would be uh, the winner in our, in our space race, okay? Okay, so the Intrepid, um, when did the space race start? Guys, October 4th, 1957, the Soviet Union launched this into space. Once again, you guys are pretty, uh, pretty good in the chat there. What do you think that is? Put the name of that down there. Or if you don't remember the name, what was it? Um, I can give you a hint. It's a, it's a, it was about the size of a beach ball. Okay, we're in the summer now. Um, today is an excellent day to go to the beach. Feels like temperatures, I was just speaking with Alicia, over 100 degrees. Um, but do that after the presentation. We want you to stay here. It's got four weird metal things coming off of it that kind of look like antennas. That could be another hint there. If you, if you think this is a satellite, you're absolutely correct. It would, not, it would not be Rasputin. This is Sputnik, okay? Sputnik. Um, the world's first man-made satellite in orbit around the Earth. This is going to do a few things. This is going to scare the United States to death because we hadn't even done that yet, but the Soviets did that. So the United States is going to follow up a few months later. You got it, Allison Sputnik? With this, that is Explorer 1. This is the United States or the American uh, satellite. That was their first one to go around the, uh, to orbit the Earth. Kind of looks like a jellyfish with those antennas coming off there, right? It kind of looks small, but it's actually not. This was seven feet long, guys. So it was a rather big, so it was a lot bigger than Sputnik. Um, so that was launched. Another result 
of uh, Sputnik, the Sputnik launch by the Soviet Union is the creation of this, right? NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. It's the, it's the premier space and aeronautical exploration uh, service in, uh, in the world, certainly of the United States government. Okay, 1958, uh, NASA is going to be established. But in 1961, specifically on April 12th, 1961, the Soviet Union is going to take a tremendous leap forward in the space race, and they're going to put a human being in space. Guys, let me know. Once again, you know what to do. Put it down there in the chat. Let me know if you remember his name. He was a Soviet Air Force officer, a lieutenant, actually, uh, in the Soviet Air Force. If you guessed Yuri Gagarin, you are 100% correct, okay? Soviet Air Force Lieutenant Yuri Gagarin becomes the first human being in space representing the Soviet Union. Not only did he go up into space, he actually orbited the planet. He went around one time. So we, the Soviet Union is doing a lot of firsts here. They're, they're, they're inching ahead of us here in the space race, okay? Yuri Gagarin. So a few years before Yuri Gagarin went up, um, we, the United States said, we better get going and create our own astronauts. So here we go, guys. No problem, frankly. I'm just glad you're, uh, you're with us. Um, these are the Mercury 7, the first seven astronauts of the United States. Okay, these guys are, quite frankly, the best pilots on the planet. These are Air Force, uh, Navy Marine pilots and test pilots, and one Marine guy, one Marine pilot, I'm circling John Glenn right there, the only Marine in the seven, okay? The best pilots. And these guys would be a part of um, kind of our first leg in the, in the race, okay? Now, if you're familiar with, uh, with races, even if you don't run them or enter them, you might have seen the Olympics. I'm a big fan of the Olympics, by the way. Um, kind of sorry to see them go. But, you know, sometimes races have stages, right? And they call those stages legs. And this race is no different. The space race actually had legs. The first leg is going to be uh, using equipment such as this. Okay, what is that? Put down in the chat where you think that is. Now this could uh, be uh, maybe uh, you, if you can see a giant hand, maybe you can reach down and grab this part of it, and maybe it's a bell and they're going to ring it like a bell. Uh, perhaps it's a flashlight. Maybe that hand is going to grab the same area, flick on a switch, and uh, turn on a flashlight. I can tell you that um, it's a it's a two scale replica. All right, it means it's the same size as the real thing, but unfortunately, it is not the real thing. There you go, Brian. This is a Mercury capsule in specific, but in general, it's a space capsule. Okay, and this is what was going to take our first astronauts as Americans up into space for the Mercury program. First leg of that race, the Mercury program. And the uh, Mercury 7, like again, you see here in their shiny silver astronaut uh, uh, spacesuits, which one of these guys is going to actually be the first one uh, uh, to, uh, to go up in a Mercury capsule? Uh, let me refrain that, uh, re rephrase that question. Which one of these guys is going to go into that capsule? Because that was the Aurora 7 capsule, was named by the astronaut that went into it. Um, and it was the Mercury Atlas 7. So it was the seventh Mercury mission. If you think you know the name of the astronaut, one of these guys that uh, went up in the Aurora 7, that specific capsule that you can come see when you visit the Intrepid, uh, put his name down in the chat. Yep, it's the part where astronauts ride in. Come on, guys, you can get this. Was it John Glenn? Yeah, they're kind of hard to tell from each other here, but you might remember from your history that it was that guy, okay, Scott Carpenter. Scott Carpenter is going to be the guy who's going to go up in that Mercury 7 uh, capsule, the Aurora 7, okay, the first leg of the race. Now, what was Intrepid's role in this? Well, um, as you can see uh, here, there's uh, Scott Carpenter getting ready in a spacesuit. And on the picture on the right is the Atlas rocket. And that's the rocket that actually took him and his Mercury capsule into space. Now, the part that held him is this right up in there. You see that right there, that black part on the top of the rocket? That's where he is. 
Uh, and he was the only one in there, just one astronaut only and barely room for him. He's kind of got his back laying along the uh, where the, uh, the bottom is, his, his, his legs bent at the knees, kind of up the side there, okay? Um, what's Scott Carpenter gonna do up in his capsule? He's gonna orbit the earth three times like the guy before him, John Glenn did. So he was the second American to orbit the planet. He's gonna go around three times. It's gonna take him just under five hours to do all of that. Some of the things he's gonna do, uh, do while he's up there, some experiments, they gave him a handheld video camera. He's gonna point it out the window that he had there and he's gonna be tasked with taking some video pictures uh, of the surface of the earth and the and the film of atmosphere that's around our planet. Um, didn't really get to do, get to take so many great shots. Uh, the capsule was kind of not the smoothest ride in the world. A couple of other things he's gonna do is he's gonna be the very first American astronaut because the Soviets beat us to this one too, guys. The very first American astronaut to eat in orbit, okay? Eat in space. Because the first leg of this race, the Mercury program was all about testing these simple things that we had no idea we were going to be able to do in space. We had no idea we were going to be able to eat in space. We didn't even know for sure if we were going to be able to breathe comfortably in space. Were we going to be able to sleep in space? We had to test all these things out. So Scott Carpenter is going to be the first American to eat his solid food. He's going to have, and I apologize, but this was the official uh, uh, um, distinction, the official title of what he did. He's going to eat meat lozenges okay i don't uh, really think that's gonna uh, uh you know pique your appetite it surely doesn't mind meat lozenges so when it became time but here's the thing when it became time for him to eat those meat lozenges uh where they were stowed uh, some equipment settled in the launch and it fell down kind of on the meat lozenges and kind of smushed them okay so when it became so when he was able to retrieve them not only were they non-appetizing, but they were all smushed. So he kind of opened one a little bit. He took a little bite and he kind of had a hard time getting it open from the from the wrapping. And he said, oh, you know what? Forget about this. I'm going to my backup. And I would have too if I was him because in his, his backup was a candy bar. Now, there you go. OK, now we're talking eating in space. But here's the problem with that. The capsule got pretty hot through all the launch and all the procedures going on over 100 degrees. Now, Scott was safe in his spacesuit, but the candy bar completely melted. So he opened up a little bit. It was all melty chocolatey goo. So he decided, you know what, uh, uh, NASA, I'm going to just uh, uh, forget about the eating experiments. We've done enough for today. And they agreed. OK. All right. So back to um, uh, what the Intrepid did. What was Intrepid's role? I think some of you got it here in the uh, in the chat. Yeah, Tom, there you go. Capsule retrieval. Now. The intrepid, uh, the, these capsules needed someone to go get them. Where do you guys think these things were going to land? Did they land on land? Did they land on water? Did they land, uh, oh, I don't know. Did they try to shoot to land on the deck of an aircraft carrier? Um, that sounds kind of crazy to me. Put down there in the chat which one you think it was. And we'll talk a little bit more about, there you go, Tom. Absolutely water, okay? Lots of water, one of the, one of the best things uh, that the United States had going in its favor going into the space program is surrounded by a lot of water and warm weather water as well uh, that were relatively calm. So we were able to use the water for these landings, okay? So coming into the atmosphere, um, it wasn't exactly the easiest time for Scott Carpenter. Um, Stories vary, and depending upon which one you want to believe, they range from he was too enthralled by the views looking out his window. Eh, maybe you can't blame him for that one. Um, there was a malfunction in his computer-operated equipment. Or maybe he just took a joyride. See, these guys were the best pilots on the planet, but they almost never let them fly these things. They were always asking for more um, to do, more piloting uh, experiences with these things. So maybe. He went for a joyride. There are some stories that he switched off computer control and just kind of did his own flying. But whatever the story is, he came into his reentry was too late. He came into the atmosphere uh, in a place that would put him down 250 miles away from his target. OK, that's pretty, pretty uh, far away. The Intrepid then had to go find this guy 
It took us three, three hours to go find him. But don't worry, he uh, is a naval aviator. He was used to going up and down in the water. When we found him, his feet were up on the side of, the, of his life raft, hands back behind his head, just enjoying a, enjoying a beautiful sunny day on the Atlantic Ocean, all right? Um, and then the, uh, the Intrepid uh, sent their helicopter over to get him. And you can see that happening right there, okay? Scott Carpenter being hoisted up into the, uh, into the helicopter, right? Whoop, didn't want to get to these guys first. Not so quickly. I wanted to pause right now and maybe see if there's some questions. Are there any questions out there, guys? Uh, why was it called Project Mercury? Excellent question. Well, let's think about that. What else is called Mercury? Um, if you can think of something else that's called Mercury, put it in the chat there. Um, some of you may be thinking of the element Mercury. It's kind of the only metal that's uh, in a natural liquid state. I don't think they would name it after a metal, the metal mercury. So what else is named mercury um, that you might know of? Maybe it's something round that we might call a planet a thermometer. Oh, okay. So, all right, we're gonna, so we're gonna talk about the planet mercury, guys. Okay, what does the planet mercury do? Well, first of all, it's the closest planet to the sun. Um, and as you might know from studying a little bit about astronomy, the planets are closest to the sun. They revolve around the sun the fastest. So that's called one year. Earth's year, we know, is 365 days. So it takes the Earth 365 days to orbit the sun. Mercury, a lot closer in, takes only 88 days to orbit the sun. 88 days is its year. So it's very fast. And Allison, you got it right there. You got both of them, the god and the planet. The Roman messenger god, Mercury, right? Um, he was quick. You know, you see uh, some uh, statues or paintings or drawings of Mercury. He's got the helmet with the wings on it, right? Maybe wings on his sandals as well. He was very, very fast. Those of you who like uh, superhero comic books or movies, The Flash. Okay, that's what we're talking. So it was named uh, after the uh, Roman god, the Roman messenger god, uh, Mercury. Great. Any other questions? Did, did Scott come to leave the capsule when he was in space? Ah, no, Scott, that wasn't a part of his, uh, of his uh, mission. That wasn't one of the experiments. That would actually come later in the next leg, the second leg of the race that I'm going to talk about in just a minute um, with American astronaut Ed White. Uh, but again, the Soviets beat us to that one. So Ed White was only the first American to, enter, to, to walk in space. But no, that wasn't a part of, of what Scott did. Okay. Okay, excellent questions, guys. We're gonna go on to leg two. You've already said this, uh, saw this slide. I kind of advanced it by mistake. Uh, leg two was called the Gemini program, okay? Uh, and by the way, put in the chat if you happen to be a Gemini, alrighty. Uh, as the name suggests, Gemini is the twins, right? The zodiac sign, the twins. Um, and so that means it's gonna give us two astronauts inside. These guys are left to right. It's uh, Air Force pilot Gus Grissom, and on the right, Naval pilot John Young. Okay, I'm going to give you that distinction because uh, um, uh, of an interesting story I'm going to tell. Um, now, this the Gemini 3 mission was their mission, and what they're going to do in space is they're going to be the first uh, missions, first American space mission to actually use the the uh, the capsule's rockets to change their orbit. Okay, so that's going to be uh, one thing that they're going to achieve. Um, and the second leg of the race, uh, now the first leg of the race was all about doing these simple things, experiments, just learning about being in space in orbit around our planet. Gemini is all about going to the moon. So it's all about transitioning from that orbital space into the moon. And we're going to be learning lots and lots of these uh, uh, skills and having these experiences that's going to help us um eventually get to the moon so here's a story they did bring up food and we're going to be experimenting a little bit more with uh with food in uh in the gemini program as well and yes it does have a, a, a um i see a couple of qu uh, questions there a couple of remarks about mythology it does have a connection to to greek mythology as well the twins in uh, mythology were um castor and pollux and if you look up in the sky 
and see the constellation of, of Gemini, the heads of those twins are those stars, okay, Castor and Pollux. So it's a pretty easy constellation to find out. Um, so these guys are going to go up and uh, start to do some more experimenting with food, okay? This is what the food kind of looked like. Um, we're not going to go into too much uh, detail with the food because we've got a program coming up, okay? Snacking in space. And Elise is going to take care of that program for you guys next Thursday. So in a week, tune in for that, Snacking in Space. Okay. Um, and she's probably going to do a little talking about this astronaut as well. By the way, my very famous astronaut, Peggy Whitson. And um, she's got her tortilla hamburger here. Um, I'm not quite sure if that looks appetizing or not. Kind of looks like refried beans on there. But the onions look good. And that's either cheese or mustard. I'm not sure. But um, what do you think the reason is that, the, that this hamburger is not on bread? Just put it down there in the chat. Why is it on a tortilla? I actually had this problem eating lunch today. I was eating a couple of pieces of bread. You got it, Vash. Crumbs, they get everywhere. You don't want crumbs getting into the machinery, okay? Getting into the, uh, uh, getting everywhere. Tortilla is a lot less crummy, and you'll find out more about that when you tune in on the 16th. By the way, guys, my favorite part about this picture is the Santa hat up there strapped to the wall, okay? It's apparently a Christmas time program. All right. Um, we were talking about the Gemini program, specifically Gemini 3. They also, came down over the water, okay? But the parachutes opened up. These guys did a much better job of, of their re-entry, entering the atmosphere much closer to where they should have. Parachutes opened up and they splashed down only 60 miles away from where they were supposed to be. So a lot easier and a lot quicker for uh, Intrepid and the helicopter to find them. In fact, uh, the green dye went out of the capsule that helps us locate the capsule from the air, the, the pilots and the crew of the helicopter. The flotation ring inflated around the side of the capsule. So by the time the divers got down to the capsule, opened the doors, there they were. There's Gus and John just hanging out there. Um, and they were, they were easy to be picked up by the, um, by the helicopter. And in this case, the Intrepid was, ap ac was actually able to retrieve the capsule as well. There you see them picking up that capsule with a crane on the side of the Intrepid. And if you come to see the Intrepid today, you can still see that albeit a replica of the Gemini capsule, right there uh, on the starboard side. That'd be the right side of the Intrepid, just uh, right by the island, okay, the big structure on the top there. Alrighty, um, I believe we can go to our second question break. Are there any questions there? Were any other capsule programs named at the Greek mythology? Wow, yeah, they loved their Greek and Roman mythology, uh, NASA did. Um, we're going to talk about the third leg in the race coming up. That certainly was named uh, after Greek mythology. You might have guessed it's the Apollo program. We're going to talk about that in just a few minutes. Um, at the end of the program, we're going to talk about a little bit about the future and what we can look forward to coming up actually really soon. Apollo had a twin sister named Artemis. So there's a program named Artemis. Um, there's a capsule named Orion. That's from Greek mythology as well. So absolutely. Um, excuse me. And I think that we're going to have a lot more in the future. So Greek and Roman mythology, a, a lot more to come. Good question. Is there another one? Do they eat better food in space now? Oh, it's tons better, tons better. Um, I'm going to actually leave it at that because I want you to uh, tune in for more on August 16th, OK? But uh, it's much better. It's much appetizing. Um, yeah, we'll leave it at that. OK. So guys, we're going to move into the third leg because we've run two legs of this race. We're, we're inching ahead of the Soviets now because they were ahead of us for most of the beginning of the race, the first leg and even the second leg. But now we're in front of them. And with this third leg, the Apollo program, we're going to jump way ahead of the Soviets in the space race in that race to the moon. Here, guys, three familiar faces. Uh, the guy on the left there is uh, uh, Neil Armstrong. Uh, would be the first American to walk on the moon. Guy in the middle is Michael Collins. He was the command module pilot. He didn't get to walk on the moon, um, but very, very important part of that mission, the Apollo 11 mission. And of course, to the right there on the right is Buzz Edwin, Buzz Aldrin. Okay, the most famous Apollo mission was Apollo 11. 
Um, Buzz Aldrin would follow Neil Armstrong out onto the moon about 20 minutes after Neil first took that historic step, okay? Um, and then they would blast off from the surface of the moon and go and dock with the command module, which was in orbit uh, all under, of course, the, the, uh, the watch of Michael Collins. Now, here's a little known story. A lot of people don't know this one. Michael Collins never felt jealous of the other two guys. He never um, was sorry that he didn't get to walk on the moon uh, by Apollo 11. In fact, he was, is quoted as relishing his time alone uh, in, in the Apollo capsule. Without the other two guys there, he had a little bit more uh, elbow room, okay? And another little known uh, aspect of Michael Collins, he was actually scheduled to be the commander of Apollo 18, and the commander does get to walk on the moon. Only one problem, there was no Apollo 18. Apollo 17 was the final Apollo project. Congress cut the, the budget, so he never did get to walk on the moon. But listening to the guy, never felt bad about that. So there were nine Apollo missions that actually went to the moon. Six of them would land on the moon, placing 12 astronauts. So 12 astronauts were actually walking on the moon. Now the Apollo program finished the race, okay? This was built off of the baby steps um, and the things we learned in the Mercury program, leg one, in the Gemini program, leg two, okay? And this effectively with the third race, the third leg, the Apollo program ended that space race. Let's talk a little bit uh, about life in space. Um, I mentioned a little bit, it was cramped in the Apollo capsules. Uh, it was probably, uh, you probably got the idea, it was very cramped, especially in the Mercury capsule with Scott Carpenter. But what was life like in space orbiting the Earth? What was life like going to the moon? Give me some ideas, if you will, in the chat. What do you think was going on with these guys? What did they have to face, the dangers? What were some of those problems um, that they had to, to face while going to the moon or even just staying in orbit? Uh, I kind of alluded to one before, okay? Uh, here on Earth, where we have gravity and our bodies are acclimated to what we call 1G, and that is the, gravity, the gravitational pull of the Earth. And gravity, of course, pulling us down towards the center of the Earth. We're used to that. Uh, up in space, we are in what's called microgravity. So that's why we're floating and everything else is floating around, including all those crumbs if you're going to eat bread in, in your capsule. So that's one problem. It causes all kinds of issues, um, like fluid shift, for example. And I believe you're going to hear more about that on, uh, on next Thursday when we talk about food. It kind of makes the astronauts' uh, sense of taste kind of go away. So that's why they like spicy foods. What are some of the other problems, guys? Put it down in the chat. Some of the problems that human beings face in a microgravity environment, uh, even today at the International Space Station. <laughs> imagine feeling your insides moving around. Yes, Vash. I can imagine that. Uh, or, you know, I'm a roller coaster guy. So, you know, I, I get thrown around. I would imagine during launches and, and re entries, it might even be, uh, it might even be worse than that. Frankly, uh, frankly, yeah, you got it. Okay. Eating in space can be an issue. We kind of have that down a little bit. Coldness. Ah, pressure. Okay, you got it. Pressure. So here on Earth, we're used to 14.7 um, PSI, pounds per square inch, acting on us, on our bodies at all times. Okay, imagine something weighing 14.7 uh, pounds on each square inch of our, um, of our bodies. Okay, imagine that. One here, there's one here, one here, all the way around our bodies, all over our bodies. Um, that we don't even think about it anymore. That's what we're used to. Okay, we've adapted to that. In space, that pressure goes away. Now we're wearing our spacesuits, so it does help to keep the, the pressure in. But what would happen hmm, if that if if uh, we we were not wearing our spacesuits? And during the Apollo missions, they were able to step out of their spacesuits and. Uh, later on in the shuttle missions, they were able to do so. And in the International Space uh, Station, they wear normal clothes, uh, uniform clothes up there in the space station as well. Imagine yourself on the Apollo 11 capsule, let's say, and you're out of your spacesuit. You got a break from wearing that big bulky suit, uncomfortable suit, and a hole popped into your spacecraft and you have sucked down into space. Oh my goodness, what's gonna happen? Let's take a look at this, okay, guys? So in this experiment, and this is one of the demonstrations that 
we uh, used to do at the Intrepid Museum. We're going to take this bell jar, okay? That's a bell jar there. And it's hooked up to that vacuum pump. You see the hose there on the right. And what that does is suck all the air out of there. Of course, inside there is what it looks like. It's a jar of water, okay? Now, full disclosure, this water is at room temperature. It's not heated. Um, it is not uh, uh, chilled, okay? There is nothing on the bottom of the bell jar, okay, to interfere with this. So what do you guys think is going to happen to that water when we suck that air out using the vacuum? Put it down there, put it down there in the chat. Okay, we got an answer from Vash. You can see it here. What's going on, Vash? It's boiling. Now we're used to boiling water by adding heat and adding energy, introducing energy to the water. No heat exchange here. It's just the pressure is being reduced, okay? So what would happen? Uh, it turns out our bodies are what? Uh, about 60, 65% water, right? If you take away that 14.7 PSI from our skin, our liquids and fluids are gonna start to boil. You can feel them kind of like pop rocks, right? On your tongue, remember that candy you used to eat? Maybe I'm aging myself. Anyway, feel like a popping sensation, okay? So that is one of the problems. There's lots of, lots of uh, uh, things to, um, to overcome before we uh, uh, make space regular, make space a regular flight. Sorry, a regular experience. When we uh, disconnect the hose and of course reintroduce air into the system, that water will condense back into its natural state at room temperature, which is a uh, liquid. What about your lungs, guys? Okay, air goes into your lungs. We need air to breathe. Check out this next experiment. We have these two balloons here. We have this red balloon. It's got a little air in it, right? Um, uh, not a whole lot, but it's got a little bit in there. And that represents your lungs with air inside. And the next balloon, of course, is the blue balloon. And uh, it doesn't have any air in it. Now, realistically, it's got a little air in it. We can't you know, take all the air out, but it's not very much air in there. So let's represent uh, uh, your lungs with that blue balloon in breathing out. You breathe out all the air. Let's say uh, you were able to survive that being thrown out into the void of space, okay? Would you, uh, uh, as far as the pressure differential, but you still have to breathe with no air, would you be better off, and let me pause it here, would you be better off taking a deep breath before you got sucked down into the, in, into the void of space, or would you be better off uh, breathing out and trying to get rid of all that air from your lungs? Put down there in the, in the chat what you think you would do. What would you do? Would you take a deep breath uh, in your last breath of air? Or would you uh, try to expel all that air out of your lungs? What would be the best for you guys to do? Vash says, neither. <laughs> I guess you would just go halfway. I'm not quite sure. Let's find out what the experiment does, OK? Remember, the red balloon is a deep breath. The blue balloon, you breathe all the air out. So what we're going to do is we're going to Take all the air out of there and watch that red balloon. What's going on with that red balloon? Hmm. It's growing, isn't it? The air is expanding, okay? It's expanding in the low pressure. And uh, it's a good thing rubber is kind of stretchy or it, that balloon would pop. I mean, eventually, if you put enough air into it, that balloon is going to pop. But look at the blue balloon. That's inflating a little bit because there is a little bit of air in there, but that's certainly not going to, uh, be a problem, a problem, right? Now, if our lungs uh, could, they can only stretch so far, uh, so our lungs might burst. Okay, so those of you who said, I'm going to take a deep breath in, by instinct, uh, at least, frankly, and that might be uh, a few seconds less uh, to your lifespan there on that one, okay? And of course, the fun part is when you take the, the hose out, they all go flying around the bell jar. That's kind of cool. So what you'd rather do is uh, you'd rather uh, breathe out. So you'd be like the blue balloon, the, the lungs would only inflate a little bit, but you don't wanna do either, frankly, okay? And some of you said that in the chat, like Vash, you said neither. You don't really wanna do either. You just wanna stay in your spacesuit and stay safe in your capsule. Okay, but that's lungs, okay? So what happens to the rest of our body when we go out into space and we're stuck in the vacuum of space, no pressure, uh, you're in microgravity, no air to breathe. Whoops, what happened there? Let's find out. And whoops, okay, we're gonna start all over again. Let's see if I can get us back to where we should be. Uh, 
Okay, there's our lungs popping from the air. We're about to pop. So look at this marshmallow, okay? This represents our skin, okay? It's closer to our skin tissue than a, than a balloon is, right? What's happening to that uh, marshmallow as we're sucking that air out? It's expanding. What's going on there exactly? What's inside marshmallow? Well, we know there's a lot of air in there. Um, so that's what's expanding and making it expand. But what happens when we, uh, uh, when we uh, let the air back in? Let's say someone reached you, grabbed you by the leg and threw you back into the capsule and patched up the hole, all right? After you've swelled up and your body got all swollen, what would happen then? Let's take that hose off and find out. Just pull that hose right. Oh, no. You shrunk all down. All that air comes all out. So uh, you're, you're kind of a shrunken mess there. Right? Look at that marshmallow. You can still eat that. Probably tastes pretty good. But uh, much like the meat lozenges that Scott Carpenter had to eat, not the most appetizing thing in the world. Right? All right, guys. Let's talk about um, what we're doing now in this in in space exploration. Okay, if you come to the uh, enter to the Intrepid in a big white building on the uh, back of the flight deck of the Intrepid, you can go inside. It's the space shuttle pavilion. You can see this. This is the um, not the Starship Enterprise. Come on, house. This is the space shuttle Enterprise. It's the first space shuttle. Okay, we have that at the Intrepid. Uh, one of my favorite places at Intrepid to be and just hang out with the people. Uh, if you were thinking Starship Enterprise, you're not completely that far off. In fact, you might see a picture or two of the Starship Enterprise somewhere in the Space Shuttle Pavilion. Um, but this was the very uh, first Space Shuttle. A couple of things I want you to understand about the Space Shuttle program. Number one, the uh, Space Shuttle program was never designed for passengers, okay? It was never designed to do anything uh, except carry uh, experiments, big heavy pieces of equipment like pieces of the ISS, International Space Station, satellites to be launched into orbit around the Earth, okay? It was never meant to do anything but that. Think of it as a space cargo truck. That's what it really was. Number two, the space shuttle, pro uh, space shuttle program was never designed to go anywhere um, uh, further than what we call low Earth orbit. In fact, these space shuttles never went anywhere higher than about 350 miles away from where you and I are sitting right now, okay? And it only did that four to five different times to service and launch the Hubble Space Telescope. Most of the time, it was significantly uh, closer to the surface than that. So we were going to transition from planetary exploration to going into low Earth orbit and doing orbital um, doing things in orbit, okay, with a hopefully reusable spacecraft because the space shuttle was designed to blast off like a rocket. Here you see that space shuttle orbiter. Now the orbiter is the plane part, kind of looks like an airplane, sort of. And the liquid fuel tank, which is the orange big tank here, and the two solid rocket boosters on the right there, that is called the space shuttle collectively. It was designed to blast off like a rocket, go into orbit, and come back into the atmosphere from orbit and land like an airplane, okay? Now, the Enterprise was the structural test article. It was the test model. It was never um, designed to go into space, um, but it, it, and so it never did. But it was um, very important nonetheless, no less important than any of the others. In fact, it made it possible for all the other orbiters to go into space. There were six orbiters total. Um, 135 missions were flown by those other five orbiters besides the Enterprise uh, into uh, low Earth orbit into space. Now, the space shuttle program, folks, ended in 2011, on July 21st, 2011, uh, after those 135 highly successful missions. But there were problems with the space shuttle. We don't have to get into them there. Let's just say it went significantly over budget. Um, and they wanted to start thinking about what they wanted to do after. So the Enterprise, um, after it did its testing up on the back of the 747, like you see here, it went up like this eight times, guys. The last five times it came off the 747 and glided to that landing on a runway like you saw before, okay? Called Approach and Landing Tests, ALTs. The Enterprise would be retired by NASA in 1982. 
And uh, it would go on a world tour, going to different places. It'd be part of the Louisiana World Expo or the World's Fair. It would go to London, it would go to France, uh, other places overseas. Um, and then it would find its home at the Smithsonian in Washington, DC. But the discovery became available to the Smithsonian. And so they wanted the discovery. The enterprise became available. And so the Intrepid was able to get the, um, the long bidding process that we won. And we were able to get it, thank goodness, uh, to come uh, to us in New York City, where everybody can see it uh, when you come to visit the Intrepid. So they're going to put it on the back of 747. They're going to fly it up to New York City. It's going to do a victory lap or two around the island of Manhattan there. You see the Empire State Building, okay, before finally landing at JFK. Um, so without a space shuttle uh, program anymore, guys, that left us only one way to get into space. And you're looking at that way right now. What are we looking at? What do you think that is, guys? Um, yeah, I know it's a rocket. What kind of rocket? Well, more importantly, whose rocket do you think that is? It uh, looks pretty different than most rockets we've looked at so far. The, the design is kind of different than most American rockets, than all American rockets, especially this bottom part right here, the main stage engines. No, it didn't belong to China, Vash. In order, after the, sh the space shuttle program was retired, it left us no choice but to partner up with our former Cold War adversaries, the Russians, you got it, Vash, the Russians, okay? In their Soyuz rockets, that's what you're looking at right now, Soyuz rocket, we had to use them to, to partner up with them to go into space. Okay? Now, the Soyuz rocket right up here at the top where I'm circling, similar to what I showed you on the Mercury launches, it's the Soyuz spacecraft, okay? The three astronauts, okay, three astronauts, sometimes two would ride up, but in the three astronauts um, would be up here in the orbital module. That's the, the section here up in the front. Dock with the ISS. They would get out, uh, perform their six months of duty. Meanwhile, uh, three other astronauts who finished their shift in the ISS would get back into the orbital module. They'd crawl into the, the reentry module here in the middle, right? Detach from the ISS, the orbital module would detach from the reentry module, and the white area here, the the um, the service module here, would detach as well. Those two would burn up coming back into the atmosphere. Um, this part, the reentry module, like it says, would re-enter the atmosphere and bring the astronauts safely back uh, back home. And also, if you do come to the uh, Intrepid and go to the space shuttle pavilion, you will be able to see something that did go into space. Okay, the reentry module here. We got one of those right there. Actually flew into space. Okay, and it looks all charred up because uh, it did make that reentry um, and the heat shield burned up, um, but it did make a safe landing. Now we know that the American uh, missions landed in the water, except for the space shuttle landed uh, on a runway. Where do you think the Russian missions land? Do they land on land? Do they land in the water? Okay, Vash says war scars are cool. Okay, yes, but uh, let's try not to have any more wars. Um, where do you think they landed? Hmm. If you say they landed on land, that's exactly where they are. Okay, big parachutes come out again. They're going to land on land. Now, um, what you're seeing here is the landing in the desert in Kazakhstan, okay? That is where the Russian space program, Roscosmos, that's where they land their missions, okay? The picture in the right there um, is showing their retro rockets. Now, when this gets all the way down to only one meter, okay, only three feet or so, a little more than three feet above the desert sand, those rockets are gonna fire to slow them down finally to make a nice, comfortable, well, maybe not so comfortable, not as comfortable as it would have been in the water, okay? Um, and the three astronauts uh, are gonna have a little, a little bump there, but don't worry, uh, um, every expense is made to keep them comfortable. For example, the seats that they're in are memory foam, right? How many of you have a memory foam bed? Uh, I can have a memory foam top of, of our, my bed, but I wish I had the whole thing memory foam might help me with my sleeping. Um, three astronauts crammed in there. Now, if you're even a little bit claustrophobic, that might not seem comfortable. But if you're not, um, that might seem kind of cozy in there, okay? You have the three guys that are no, no uh, doubt uh, coming back from a, a six-month-long stay on the ISS. Um, 
yeah, I see an American astronaut there. Looks like a Russian astronaut in the middle, and a Canadian astronaut there. Uh, uh, Hadfield, that's the Canadian astronaut there on the right. It looks like him anyway, right there. Okay. So you have that landing on land. Guys, a, a couple of years ago, um, the next American space program has been announced. And it is what I kind of mentioned a little bit before, the Artemis program, okay? Uh, the Greek god Apollo, the major god of the sun and music and, and all sorts of cool things, had a twin sister. Artemis, okay, Artemis is, uh, is an, one of the nature deities in Greek mythology. Um, there's a reason why we chose the name Artemis, um, a female goddess, to represent the next stage of the American space program is because it's definitely going to have a female bent. Artemis is set to, um, to take us back to the moon by the year 2024, okay, sometime in the year 2024. Hopefully, if everything goes okay, we can expect to land on the moon again. Uh, and in that crew of what will be four astronauts at the time will be the first woman to walk on the moon and the first person of color to walk on the moon. OK, so um, the man on the moon will have a lot of company. OK, he'll have a woman with him and he'll have a first person of color with him, as well as three other ast astronauts as well. But you may be asking yourself, why are we going on the moon? Why don't we go to Mars? Remember, baby step, folks, baby steps. It is in the plans. And in fact, it's in the plans to take the Orion, the Orion capsule um, eventually to Mars sometime in the 2030s, okay, sometime in the 2030s. Artemis is going to visit the moon in three stages. Remember those baby steps. The first stage is set to be launched this year, November 22nd, guys. Be on the lookout for that launch. And maybe Intrepid Program will do all kinds of, uh, the Intrepid Museum will do a program for you guys to, to come and see, maybe something virtually. We'll talk about that as well. November 22nd will be the remote control robotic mission from Earth to the moon, orbit the moon, come right back to the Earth. Uh, Artemis 2 will be a crewed mission. You'll have four astronauts in there, once again, from the Earth to the moon, orbit around, come back safely. And number three, right? sometime hopefully in the year 2024, we'll land those four human beings uh, on the moon again. And by the way, all four of those astronauts might not be Americans either. Stay on the lookout for that as well. Okay, guys, so I want to thank you so much for joining me on this uh, Jim's journey to space, okay? I'm always uh, uh, glad to talk a, a little bit about my passion and that space travel. Um, I want to do remind you once again, join me next Tuesday, um, the, the 17th, okay, one day after Intrepid's birthday, but we're going to be celebrating that birthday on another uh, live Intrepid's virtual adventures. We're going to be talking about six ships named Intrepid. We're going to examine the name of Intrepid throughout history. We're also um, on Thursday, uh, we're going to have Alicia. She's going to be up here talking about all that space food. Okay, snacking in space. Okay. All right, guys. So thank you once again for joining us. Um, once again, if you want to uh, give your feedback, Alicia, just put those links in the, in the chat there. Uh, check those out and click on that link. Give us your feedback, what you thought about this uh, program. All right. And we'll see you next time on Intrepid Adventures. Bye, guys.